other announcements for today, upcoming days, we have a worship board meeting after church. The fall book study, The Flag and Cross, White Christian Nationalism and its Threat to Our Democracy, meets on Wednesday from 1 to 2 p.m. The fall spirituality group, uh, featuring Beverly Lanzetta's book, Emerging Hearts, starts next Sunday. Also, the Neighbors in Need offering for this month, the theme is Mental Health Justice for All. Join with me in the invitation that we share week after week. Whoever you are, and wherever you are, In the ancient world, it was bread that kept the poor and working class from starving to death. Yesterday afternoon. 
change of seasons. Anyone brought out a little light jacket or sweater yet? Anyone brought out a little light jacket? Already? Okay, you got, you got a hoodie. That counts. That counts. Now, what did that ring with you today? This is not a light jacket. What is this? That's a winter coat. And it's my oldest winter coat. I've had it since I was a student in the, in the 90s. Actually, it's a Boston Bruins jacket that I got in Boston. <laughs> yeah, lots of snow there. So, I want you to talk about, do you have a good winter coat? Okay, so if you don't have a good winter coat, just... Well, if you need a winter coat, let me know, because one of our big mission projects this, this season is to work with kids in a church project. Those who need winter coats, part of our mission outreach, is to buy them winter coats. And we've set aside part of the budget to do that. So it is wonderful to share, to get something essential. Because how many like being really cold? There's a place called Buffalo for you. If you really like being cold, there's a place for you in the universe. But uh, when we think of life, let us be grateful for, one, heat, right? And also winter coats. Let us pray together. Oh, boy. Loving God, we're thankful for the gift of those who care about us and care about those in need. And we're thankful for all those who share with us. Amen. My dad likes it cold. All right. <laughs> I think that coat is indestructible. It's made of some weird material that's going to be lasting another 50 years. <laughs> in terms of joys and concerns, we continue to pray for the families in grief with the stunning losses from Hurricane Helene. On Thursday, I left messages with three sister churches in Asheville, North Carolina, to ask what is the most desperate need in this time, to see if there can be help through our church or other churches or communities. Uh, but one, of them, one that I was able to get in touch with said they're actually using Facebook as their communications technology and then all the phone lines being down. So we pray for that city and for all the regions impacted. Peace, shalom, shalom. We pray for those dealing with grief in our own church. Carolyn Holmgren's brother died unexpectedly after a full and wonderful life at age 87. Carolyn Ely's brother died unexpectedly at 66, and she is with the family in California. So we pray for both families in these times of year in the rage of loss and ask that they be blessed with good memories. Peace. Shalom. Shalom.
give a um, website on our church website, or you can use the envelopes for a check. So thank you very much. That's a colorful shirt. Thank you. We've been gone for a while, maybe you noticed. We uh, finally got something to turn on our bucket list. We went to Canada, eh? <laughs> we took a train ride through the Canadian Rock, which was really cool. We went from Banff to Vancouver. It was really nice. In keeping with traveling, we got COVID on the way home. So we've been gone another two weeks. Rather than get a shot, we decided to go through the whole deal. <laughs> So here we are back again. It's good to be here. Nice to see everyone. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Ken. I have two joys to share. The first one is uh, my grandson Blake and his two friends made it home safely um, from Louisville, Kentucky, and the music uh, festival that they went to. Uh, even though. Uh, Friday they were rained out because of the remnants from the league. The car was a little muddy, but no worse for the wear. Uh, the second great joy was uh, we hosted the Western Association Conference Friday and Saturday, and it was a wonderful time with great people, and uh, I, had, I had a lot of fun. Cooking and serving food. See, I'm here, and just to echo what Ken said, we had a really wonderful uh, fall association meeting for the Western Association. And thank you, Ken, and the Fellowship and Hospitality team for all the hard work, and thank everybody who brought uh, dessert and other items for the dinner on Friday night. We had a wonderful worship service. And uh, just one other item, I happened to run into Red at the grocery store the other day. She is, apparently she had a heart attack, and she is recovering. She was with her cue and had to do some shopping. And then her mother had a fall, and she is now in Manti Heights. But they're both doing better, and they hope to be back soon. And they said to say hi to everybody. Let communion teach us in the act of 
understand that we are the bread of the world to share bread with the world. We pray this as we follow in the steps of Jesus who taught us to pray by saying, Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. Martha works with you, so where are you at, Martha? Give an introduction for him. Well, that's a surprise. <laughs> that's not true. Okay. Um, I stood up in the meeting of the Western Association yesterday, and I, I said, you know, folks, we are so fortunate that Aaron Gilmore has stepped into this space at this time. Um, I have never worked with anybody who could, on the one hand, sit down and strategize, determine process, and line it out just like an engineer, Michael. And then on the other hand, step up and give you the most high-level inspired um, uh, vision but where we need to be going, and that's here. So I've worked with her for 12 years, and I just, every year, I appreciate her more and more. And I feel so fortunate to be here today. Well, I'm just going to come up here. Uh, it is such a joy to be here. Thank you, Martha. Thank you, Paul, for the invitation. Uh, and to not only get to spring news, but also just participate in worship. Uh, it's a joy for me. So, Aaron, I'm Aaron Gilmore, I'm the Transitional Conference Minister, and was here for the Western Association meeting, which was indeed full of joy. It was such a gift to be here. Uh, you have such incredible people, Karen, Martha, Ken, just the uh, gifts, K Carolyn, Mark, I could go on and on. This church is so full of people who share their bread, who share their gift. And, uh, and we are the benefits of it. So on behalf of the Rocky Mountain Conference, which make our, we have 70 churches, two that want to join us, which is very exciting. And we had the most recent church join uh, on Friday night. Community Spirit in Montrose became an official church of the United Church of Christ. So um, it's exciting that people see who we are in the United Church of Christ and churches that are saying, you know what, we no longer are willing to stay on the sideline of not being an affirming congregation. And so they're looking for denominations that where their values can be upheld rather than where they have to dissent all the time. And so, um, and so it's a joy just to bring greetings on behalf of all of the churches across the conference, uh, Colorado, Utah, and Wyoming. We're, we're 70 churches, we are five associations, and we're just over 9,000 members. And we're growing, and that's exciting to say. Uh, and there are churches that are coming to the end of their life. And in their end, they are being faithful even in that and saying, how do, our, how do our assets, how does our legacy continue to carry forward the progressive values that we so desperately need and want to share in the world? And so as I think about this, this, this metaphor of bread, I'm thinking about your generosity through our church's wider mission. Through your church's wider mission, your giving to per capita, your giving to OCWM, you have provided bread um, and helped contribute to the bread that is the, in the mud grants. We just gave out 13 in the mud grants to churches across our conference. And they're doing everything from food pantries to um, young adult outreach. Some are creating podcasts out of their sermons to be able to share more broadly. That's how a lot of younger people hear words, and so let's get those words in the spaces they are listening. Uh, there's a children's corner and a pride parade, many, many things. So the In the Mud grants are grants that were given to churches every year to, to outreach to their community. Um, as I said, we have two churches that are uh, pursuing affiliation with the United Church of Christ. 
We have 13 members in discernment. These are people who are seeking to be ordained or to be authorized in the United Church of Christ. We have four more who are um, potentially going to be joining us. We're uh, entering into that process. Uh, we have four churches in search. So, uh, you know, not too long ago, this church was in search. Chair over there. <laughs> And, uh, and by you contributing to our church's wider mission, we get to help support churches who are in that space of transition. So we have four churches in transition. Uh, we have 272 ministers in our conference. And so through your church's wider mission, we help provide training and uh, ongoing support and connection so that clergy can find support and not be isolated and uh, feel, feel connection. So, we support 272 authorized ministers, um, and in addition to all of the, just the regular things that conference does, we are also in the season of what is it most essential for us to be about as a conference. And for me, it always comes back to the local church, these spaces. There's an author that has written a book that says Gone for Good, that's the title, and he says in the next five years, 100,000 churches are going to close. 100,000 churches. I'd like to say that all the progressive churches, I don't want those ones to close. <laughs> uh, and so in the United Church of Christ, right, this is all denominations. That's the prediction. And when a church closes, when a building on a corner that has been proclaiming this space of love and generosity and kindness and bravery and courage, these values that are so important, when these spaces cease to exist, like those markers of these anchors of our communities cease to exist. And so as a conference and as a board of directors, we are asking ourselves, what is the most essential thing we can do to help congregations thrive and continue to carry out the mission that God has placed upon you? Because it matters. What you do in and out every week, every day, this space matters. It matters for those of us who have been part of churches, and it matters for us who haven't ever stepped inside the church. These spaces that speak of love and are courageous, that speak truth to power. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> and for you that support him in doing that, these spaces are essential. And so I just thank you for supporting this congregation. Thank you for being who you are in Grand Junction, because you are holding open a space that is that, that people still don't believe is possible. That you can be a Christian, and you can be open and affirming, and you can stand for truth, and you can ask questions, and you can uh, be courageous in the face of power. So you matter, and I thank you so much for what you do here in Grand Junction. And as you continue to give to the conference, of course, your generosity to this community allows this this church to do what it does. So I invite us at this moment to uh, give your offering to this space, to the neighbors in need, one of the five uh, special offerings of the United Church of Christ. And again, I just praise and give thanks to God for you in this space, for your generous and uh, kind hearts that continue to raise up the church in this time. Let's see, offering plates. I'm not, I've never done this before. Okay. <laughs> Thank you.
14, verses 12 through 17, and 22 through 26, and Matthew 6, 21. On the first day of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb was sacrificed, his disciples said to him, Where do you want us to go and make the preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent to his disciples, saying to them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him, and wherever he enters, say to the owner of the house, The teacher asks, Where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. So the disciples set out and went to the city and found everything as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover meal. When it was evening, when it was evening, he came with the twelve. And while they were eating, he took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, gave it to them, and said, Take, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, and all of them drank from it. He said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly, I tell you, I will never again drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. When they had sung the hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. In our Bible study classes, I often make the point that we can't understand Jesus or the New Testament unless we put on yamakas to understand the roots of his faith, to understand the courage of his faith. And we look at the experience of communion as close as we get to the experience of Jesus is a Jewish Passover Seder dinner. I have been a guest on seven or eight occasions for a Seder dinner at a synagogue. And the point of going is friendship. It's not the food. Trust me, it's not the food. The, men the menu includes bitter herbs that live up to their name. Yes, I'm sorry, but dipping parsley in salt water does not improve the taste or make it go down any easier. And I think the four little tiny cups of kosher wine are to help you just sort of wash and clear the palate after certain things are taken. But there's also the joyful singing. There's also the sharing of stories and the scripture reading of the liberation story from Exodus. Our Jewish friends across the street, they invite us to celebrate every week, I mean every year. But they also invite us to celebrate every week if we want to. But they, every year they have the Seder meal. Where? Here. In our own fellowship hall. The Seder celebrates that liberation, breaking the bonds of oppression in Egypt. So, who can attend the Jewish Passover Seder? Who can attend? Anyone. All who come with an open heart are welcome to share in the celebration. And that's important to remember. You can also go and critique the food. It doesn't matter because they agree with you. <laughs> it's the plant in your memory as you would a sort of object for children to plant in your memory a connection between the taste and the bitterness of slavery, oppression, poverty, fear. So you come with an open heart, all are welcome. And I've attended Passover Seders as part of interfaith councils. And so I've been to Passover Seders where not only were there Jewish people and Christian people, but there are also Buddhists, Hindus, Sikhs, and in San Diego and Seattle, Muslim attenders of a Jewish Passover Seder. Seder, in terms of the way they approach us, is come as you are. No membership in this local synagogue is required. Come as you are, be who you are. How revolutionary would it be if churches had the same attitude towards communion? Instead of using communion as a weapon of exclusion, and I can't believe these situations where bishops actually debate should they exclude the 
the very faithful president from experiencing communion in their local church based on a political opinion, a political viewpoint. It's an absurdity. You will never be asked in this church or any UCC church that I know, what is your position on any political issue as you come forward for communion. And I think even the classic Da Vinci painting is deceptive. Why? Because where, where exactly were the women followers? Where exactly were the people who prepared this gigantic meal for those 12 guys? I'm sure they were not told, you stay in the kitchen, you get nothing to eat. So I think Passover saviors of Jesus would have been crowded. They would have had all sorts of people. They would have had stories within stories. The other room would have been packed. So I think Da Vinci's painting is woefully inadequate and incomplete. When we think of the invitation of communion, it is come as you are, for God's love blesses you and welcomes you and invites you to a spirit of acceptance. Now what Jesus does is he takes the Passover celebration and adds to it his own symbolism of life and love for all of the disciples. He gives his life and love the symbol of the bread and the cup. Symbols that teach us that we can be liberated in following the path of Jesus in mercy and justice and love. Do this in remembrance of me is an invitation to remember his courage and compassion. This is about awakening a sense of God's blessing. The bread of life, a celebration of life itself. The cup, a reminder of the blood that flows through the heart of Jesus in creating a sharing, caring world. Communion was given to renew our faith with joyful connection. Now in the early church, from the records, communion was kind of a potluck dinner every week. We know it's snippets in various scriptures because each week the leftovers were to be given to sustain the poor, the widows, the unemployed, the needy. So I give credit where credit is due. Even though they don't have a potluck every Sunday. In terms of the celebration of communion, the Catholics, the Orthodox, the Anglicans, and the disciples have it right. It is a weekly experience in the New Testament. Part of the temptation that came out of the Reformation was to be against whatever the Catholics were for. The feeling in the past was that if you showed too much enthusiasm for the Eucharist, you could be in danger of catching Catholicism. <laughs> and part of the weakness of mainline Protestants is that we might not know exactly what we are for, but we know exactly what we are against. The Southern Baptist Church in the town where I grew up had communion only four times a year trying to show very, very diligently that they were not anything like those Catholics. And frankly, it's time to get over the 16th century divisions. We have Muslim, Hindu, Sikh, Jewish neighbors. We need to celebrate communion as bread for the world. That means all the world. Now, let me be clear. This doesn't require any literal interpretation of the elements, which is a temptation when you read the Gospel of John. At the church I first served in Springfield, Massachusetts, we had a custodian named George. And George was what you call rough around the edges. Do you get the picture of what I'm saying? He was a tough guy. George had a rather foul mouth and the vocabulary of a factory worker. He often said, in spite of his girlfriend, he often said, the only thing I love is my Harley Davidson. And I said, George, that's not true. You're just saying that. Well, I've only been at the church a week when George asked me out for lunch. And he came into the office and said, hey, Paul, you want to go 
for a grinder? And I'm like, we're talking about a wood grinder or a metal grinder? What are you talking about? And he explained that when other people in the rest of the world call a submarine sandwich, in some parts of New England, is actually called a thing called a grinder. And I was hoping that didn't describe what it was going to do to your digestive tract. <laughs> so George took me to a part of Springfield, Mass. I've never been before the old closed out factory district. And there was a biker bar in the back of the factory district. And this biker bar had these thick metal bars on the windows. And taking one look at the place, I couldn't figure out if the bars were to keep people out of the bar or keep people inside the bar from leaving. So anyway, we had a grinder and a local beer, and it was good. It was great. I think the whole experience was a little bit of hazing. He was going to see if the new minister reacts, or if the new minister just goes with the flow. So that shows you a little bit our, about our tough custodian, George. The next Monday, I'm looking for him to fix a light fixture, and I go into the sanctuary. And I see the vacuum cleaner plugged in with a long extension cord, and I don't see George. And then I hear him. He is crawling on his hands and knees across the sanctuary floor, so I'm figuring he's doing spot treatment. I don't know, something with the carpet? And then I get closer, and I notice what he's doing. Monday morning, 9.15 a.m., before he vacuumed, he crawled through the sanctuary to pick up all the little pieces of drop bread. And I asked him, what you doing, George? And he said, Reverend Paul, I'm a Catholic. I cannot suck up the body of Christ in a Hoover on the back. <laughs> OK. I said, George, you see the tradition. We don't turn the bread into Wonder Bread. But this tough, rough biker bar motorcycle rider custodian said, this is sacred to me. I'm not going to argue with that. If that's sacred to him, I'm not going to tell him to forget what's sacred to him. This very earthly guy connected to the bread that was dropped on the floor as part of the gift of Christ in his presence. The reality of diversity means we're not going to have this one interpretation of communion. We're not just going to have one Christian interpretation of the Eucharist, we're going to have multiple interpretations. Just like the rabbis in the Jewish Seder, when they celebrate with people of different faith, there's going to be different interpretations. Some of you know in the past, I have served communion to Hindu friends who believe that Jesus is a divine incarnation. Some of you don't even know there is a Hindu temple in the Redlands. Did you know that? There's a small Hindu temple in the Redlands, and if you go into their sanctuary, their temple, the center photo, the center painting is a painting of Jesus. Next to the center painting of Jesus is a painting of Krishna. They honor both as divine incarnations who teach humans the way to live as moral, spiritual beings. I've served Buddhist friends who see Christ as an exemplar of compassion. They would even use the word bodhisattva. And that came across a lot after Thich Nhat Hanh wrote a book called Jesus and Buddha as Brothers. I've served a Zoroastrian in Tulsa who was married to a church member and a person who loved Jesus without having any Christian theology. If the bread of communion belongs to Jesus, if the bread is his bread, who would Jesus not feed? Just ask. Jesus would feed the world. Jesus would share the bread with those who have no Christian theology. One of the questions church has to, church has to ask every month is, who are we feeding? Where is that bread going? I love the idea of the Code Project. So practical, down to earth. I love things that can give people immediately 
some sense of help and blessing that can last. Shockingly, some of these ways that are made with polyester and other factors, they can last you 30 years. Let me tell you about another way we shared the bread this week. We spent the entire mission budget for 2024 this week. We got down to the last 500 and some dollars, and we voted to do something to help people who are truly in need. Many of you have supported the Otani village in Kenya through this time when we kept their animals alive in a time of drought and provided other food resources. But this year, they have teachers working full time for $125 a month. Not $125 a day, not $125 per week, $125 a month. So, we recently learned that some teachers are not being paid. They don't have the resources. So we blew the end of our mission budget to send support for teachers who work for $125 a month. In this time, when politicians are trying to destroy the Department of Education and undermine public schools with alternative schools, this is a way to share our bread with the world, to make a difference on this planet Earth. I love a quote from one of my favorite preachers from seminary days, William Sloan Coffin, who wrote, the image of the church should come to mind when we celebrate Holy Communion. After breaking bread, Jesus said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. But the bread is not only a symbol of Jesus, it's a symbol of the church, which calls itself the body of Christ. The body of Christ. In other words, as members of Christ's church, Christians are brought together in one love to be broken in order to feed the world. Isn't that beautiful? We're brought together to be the bread for the world. Now, some of you have heard the beautiful quote from St. Teresa of Avila. You've heard most of just one or two abbreviated forms, so I'm going to give you the whole quote from St. Teresa. Christ has no body on earth but yours, no hands but yours, no feet but yours. Yours are the eyes through which to look out with Christ's compassion upon the world. Yours are the feet in which Jesus goes about doing good. Yours are the hands with which Jesus is to bless people now. I can't say it any better. So I just say amen.
Lord, we remember today the gift of communion. Let us remember the gift of the many hands that have shared with us, the many hands that have reached out to us, the many hands that have encouraged us day to day, week to week, and across the span of a life. For this bread is the bread of Jesus. And as he celebrated the Passover meal, he took the bread and broke it and said, This is my body, broken for you. On the same night, he took the cup and he said, This is the cup of new beginnings. Drink and remember me. May these words resonate within our hearts as we celebrate together.